can just prepare in the life. So for that, it's taking a little bit of time. All right. We're ready? Oh, we're ready. Um, in three, two, one, action. Good evening again to all my brothers and sisters there in Botswana. I actually have been following some of the presentations um, that are going on. Actually, my church here in the States, we didn't even finish yet, but um, I, you know, because of this engagement, I left early and I get to spend this time with you. I just want to say happy Sabbath. Um, I want to, again, just say how I think that camp meetings like this are especially important in light of so much is happening in the world today. And so I want to just thank the, the organizers of this event because I'm even, you know, here in the States, uh, as I'm viewing the, the presentations and things, I'm being blessed and I'm grateful for the collection of people that they've brought together for this particular one. Um, this presentation is the second in a series that I'm sharing with this group. The series is entitled Noah and Lot, A Divine Contrast. And I would really urge if you have not already seen this. So if you're tuning in via, you know, YouTube at a later time, not on December 25 of 2021, please go back and view the original presentation because it sets the stage for everything that I'm going to be talking about. The context of what I'm going to share today depends upon you understanding what I shared yesterday. And so I want to just emphasize this point that what I'm looking at and doing is I'm, I'm trying to help you see that Jesus is choosing two stories from the Old Testament. And as he chooses these two stories, he's using them in a way as like a type or a figure of earth. And, and the condition on earth right before Jesus comes. Now, this second presentation is called, it's called the message of Noah. And what I'm doing in this presentation is I want to share with you about what the Bible gives us as far as information about how Noah preached and, and what he shared with the people of that time. But before we do that, there is a little principle that I want to underline and I want to try to emphasize because this principle will make this study more relevant. So the principle is very simple. It's this. Jesus said himself that the time before the second coming would be like the days of Noah and the days of Lot. Now, for our study, we're concerned about the time of Noah. And one of the things that I want to extrapolate from this principle, from what Jesus said, is this, this idea. If the time before Jesus' coming will be like the time of Noah, then does it make sense that there is some lessons to be learned from the life of Noah for God's people who live right before Jesus comes. So let me say that one more time. Jesus said that the time right before his coming would be like, not exactly the same, but it would be like the time of Noah, which means that if that's true, and that is true, then there must be things in the life of Noah that serve as an example for God's people who are living right before Jesus comes. And based on this principle, I want to share with you a message that I've entitled the message of Noah. Now, we know that Noah was commissioned by God to not only, you know, build a boat, but he was to warn the world. And in case, you know, you may not be certain of that, I want to give you the biblical evidence for this. Let's, now, you don't have to follow along in your own Bible, but I would encourage you to do this only because as we see it for ourselves, there is greater benefit. This is from 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, and here's what it says. 
and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person. And here is four words, a preacher of righteousness. So <clears throat> 2 Peter 2.5 gives us the proof that Noah was not just a builder. He wasn't just a craftsman. Noah was commissioned by God to not only build the ark, but he was commissioned to warn the people of his day of what was about to come. But the Bible gives us some specificity about what Noah's message was. The Bible actually says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Now, I don't want to make any assumptions because there may be people in this group that may not be familiar with this term. The Bible defines righteousness as, as obedience to God's commandments. This is in Psalm 119, verse 72. The Bible says, my tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. In the simplest sense, righteousness is obedience to God's commandments. Righteousness is right doing, which in the biblical sense is obeying God's commandments. So, if we could specify what was Noah's message to the people, we could easily say that Noah was, was speaking to the people about obedience to God's commandments. And I think that when you do that, part of that is condemning the violation of God's commandments, meaning Noah was a preacher of righteousness, but I think he, in the same vein, he also condemned the, the popular sins of his day. And it's not the scope of this message, but I think that some of you know that when Jesus highlighted that they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, these were the two sins that characterized the people of Noah's day. So remember what I shared with you yesterday, I, and I hope that you are you know, familiar with some of the things that I, 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 I quoted to you yesterday, that everything that Jesus says, there is always a second meaning, like a, a deeper meaning than just what the immediate obvious uh, statement is. And when Jesus said, you know, just as it was in the days of Noah, they're eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and then the flood came and took them all away. Yes, the immediate context is simple. The people in Noah's day, so when you look at it, eating and drinking is something you do every day, okay? And marrying is something that you probably only do like once in a lifetime. Does that make sense? So here Jesus contrasts two events, short-term planning and long-term planning. And he's basically saying, in the immediate context, he's saying, they, they, not. The, the impending warning did not change their short or long-term plans. That's the immediate meaning. But when you read the, the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White actually says that the sins of Noah's day were twofold. Number one, they were eating flesh, flesh foods. And, you know, she actually says that this diet led them to being violent. And, you know, we we're, this scope of this message is not to get into, you know, diet and things, but I think you already know that this was one of the things that really cultivated the evils in Noah's day. It was their diet. Like they, they were eating flesh foods and then this led them to violence. And then they disregarded human life with basically, you know, no concern. But the marrying, giving in marriage, Ellen White also says that it was the marriage of believer with unbeliever. And this is really the source of the explanation for that statement where Ellen White talks about the amalgamation of man. Because amalgamation is ultimately the, the mixing of two things. And what Ellen White is talking about, if you, if you compare it, is she's really talking about the marriage of believer with unbeliever. And over time, this union ultimately dissolved the convictions of people and their, their, their esteem of sacred truth. And so ultimately, God foresaw that the, the truth would ultimately be wiped out of the earth. And so this was something that, you know, 
sacred marriages, they preserve the, the truth in the household and so forth. Anyway, so, so you can see that, that even in Jesus' words of marrying and giving in marriage, eating and drinking, there's a depth of meaning there. But the point that I want to make to you is that when the Bible speaks to us about, you know, what, what Noah preached, he preaches about righteousness. There was something that was important for Noah in his preaching. And I want to read this to you from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 95. So this is from Patriarchs and Prophets, page 95. And I want, to, I want to read to you what this says. It says, while Noah was giving his warning message to the world, his works testified of his sincerity. It was thus that his faith was made perfect, was perfected and made evident. And then I'm going to skip down two sentences to this next sentence. It says, every blow struck upon the ark was a witness to the people. So let me see if I can explain what, what I just read for you. Noah, Noah was a preacher and his message, the Bible says, was a message of righteousness. We learned that righteousness is is obedience to God's commandments, which means that Noah preached about obedience to God's commandments. And very likely Noah, uh, Noah rebuked the violation of God's commandments, which in turn led to the impending judgment of the flood. So Noah was a preacher of righteousness. But Ellen White says that it was not merely the preaching that had an impact on the people and on Noah. It was that by building the ark, his faith was perfected and made evident. Now, I want to do something with you that is going to seem a little bit tedious, but I want you to bear with me because as we established at the beginning of this presentation, the story of Noah is a type of what the earth will be like right before Jesus comes. And since that's true, there are things that Noah did that serve as an example for God's people right before Jesus comes. Well, this point that I want to make requires us to look carefully at what Noah did. So I want to ask you to take your Bible and go back to Genesis chapter 6. Now, in Genesis chapter 6, I want to ask you to come with me. I want to ask you to come with me to verse 14, okay? So this is Genesis chapter 6. Look with me at verse 14. And I want you to follow carefully with me here from verse 14, okay? So if you have your own Bible, if it's on your phone, but just look with me at this passage, because I want you to see this for yourself. Genesis 6, 14, notice what the Bible says. God said to Noah, now remember, this is instructions to Noah. And while the, the specifics of this do not apply to us, I want you to see if you can catch the principle of what God is telling Noah. So notice Genesis 6, 14. He said, Noah, make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. Now, the specifics of this, I think, are important. And I want to just make this note. God did not let Noah just build a boat however he wanted. God was the architect and Noah was the master builder. So please don't miss this point. It tells us that God could not accept just any ark. God was the one that designed and was really the one that orchestrated the specifics of what he wanted. And if you look at verse 14, God specifically outlines three things that he told Noah to do. He told him what kind of wood to make it out of. He told him to make rooms in it. And then he told him to waterproof it outside and inside. Okay, now come to verse 15. Verse 15, this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth 50 cubits, and the height 30 cubits. Now, again, it's not the specifics that is important, but I want you to notice that God in verse 15 says, Noah, 
I want you to make it this wide, this long, and this high. Now, this goes without saying, but in verse 15, God gave three specific instructions again on how he was to build the ark. Now come with me to verse 16. God says, a window shalt thou make in the ark. In a, in a cubit shalt thou finish it above. The door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. And lower second and third stories shalt thou make it. Now, in verse 16, God says, Noah, make a window, put it here, make a door, and make the ark three stories. Now, I want you to just think about this for a moment, because if you go from verse 14 all the way down to verse 16, I counted 10 things that God said to Noah. Noah, this is how you build the ark, okay? You can go back and look at this, but just notice that God didn't say, Noah, look, just build something that you, no. He said, Noah, this is exactly what I want you to do. And when you build the ark, I want you to make it with these specific 10 points. I want you to make the ark this way. Okay, so why is that significant? Why am I emphasizing this point? You see, Noah's message bore power. It had power. Because I read you that statement from Ellen White where she says that every blow struck upon the ark was a witness to the people. Okay, so, and I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to come back to that. But I want you to catch this. Noah was a preacher and his message was a message of righteousness. But even as Noah preached, Noah was building the ark at the same time. And I want to ask you to think about this for a moment. I want you to really think about this. Would the message of Noah have been impacted? The, would the impact have been any different if he wasn't building the ark? I, I just think about this. I want you to just think about this. If Noah was only a preacher, but he wasn't building the ark, would there have been a difference in the impact of his message? And I think that most of you would agree that and Ellen White says this. I, I, I don't think I, I, um, I did read this. Uh, okay. While Noah was giving his warning message to the world, his works testified of his sincerity. This is that same statement, Patrons and Prophets, page 95. And, and this, is why, this is why I'm emphasizing this. We, in these last days, are given a special message to the world. Okay. And our message just like Noah's message, is a message of righteousness. We are to preach to the world that God expects us to obey and to keep his commandments. But he doesn't just expect that, but you know he'll give us the power to do that. But I want you to keep in mind that Noah's message was balanced by the building of the ark, okay? Now, don't miss this, because that ark was part of his message. And, and the reason why I'm emphasizing this is many of you probably have already speculated as to why I'm going through this. In these last days, God has given us a message to give to the world. But while we give that message, there is a duty that devolves upon us at the same time as we give the message. And what is that duty? Well, you go to the book of Jude. I want you to just take a moment and come with me to Jude. And there's, you know, this book of Jude. Uh, I want you to look with me at verse 20. Jude verse 20. Here's what it says. Jude verse 20. And the Bible says here, but you, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. Now, I think that most of you understand this verse. And I use this verse, I could have skipped it, but I use this verse because the parallel of building still exists in our time. In other words, God is even in these days, not only expecting us to preach the message of righteousness, but we have to build. And what are we to build? Jude says building ourselves. Now, 
I think you know, this is not, you know, a call to bodybuilding or anything. This is talking about building our character. And think about this carefully. As we preach the message of righteousness, we are called to build a character, but God does not just expect you to just build however you think fit. God is exacting and specific. He's the architect and he has 10 specific instructions on how you are to build that character. Does that make sense? And so how is that to be done? According to God's commandments. That's how God wants you to build. In other words, in Noah's day, Noah was preaching a message of obedience to God's commandments. But the message was impacted. The message was forceful. The message was uh, people judged it as sincere because while Noah preached, he built the ark according to God's 10 instructions. And folks, I know you know this, but the Bible specifically states, and, and I, wanna, I want to read this for you, Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness, the Bible says, for a witness. Now, I want to just pause here because that's the same expression Ellen White used when she said that every blow struck upon the ark was a witness to the people. You see, one of the big reasons why evangelism today is not as effective as it should be is because as a church, while we have honed the message of righteousness by faith down, you know, we have Jones and Wagner, we have the legacy of the, the spirit of prophecy, you know, we know this message of righteousness by faith, I mean, in, in a theoretical sense, but the message does not carry with power because in the same time as the message is being delivered, the world needs to see a witness of our sincerity to that message. And in our day, it's not about building a boat. It's about building a character that is being built after the 10 instructions that God has given to us as a people. Does that make sense? Now, I know that you, I could have said this in another way. You know, I could have just said it. But types, one of the points that God, one of the reasons why God uses types to illustrate truth is because types expand upon certain points that will help us see the truth more clearly. And so when Jesus says that, you know, the time before Jesus coming will be like the time of Noah, it was his intention that as we delve into the story of Noah, we would be able to understand more clearly what our preparation needs to be in order to be prepared and avoid the destruction that's coming at the end. Well, my emphasis in this camp meeting is that before Jesus comes, if we are going to be like Noah, and that's our calling. Our calling is to emulate the man who, you know, he saw a world right before its destruction. And that's kind of us. We, we not kind of, but we are those people about to witness the destruction of the world as we know it. And so the idea for us is that as we look at Noah's life, his preaching was impacted by his actions. In other words, Noah's life was in harmony with the message that he gave. You know, I want to flip this just a moment because you, you're going to see that tomorrow, one of the emphases that I'm going to have is how we destroy our influence with our families and the world. Because you're going to see that Lot, Lot was the exact opposite. Lot said a lot of things and they were true, but nobody wanted to listen to him. The people that he lived with made fun of him and his own family members scorned him. But the reason why Noah was believed, the reason why Noah was, was powerful as a witness is because Noah's life coincided, it harmonized with the message that he was giving. By the way, I, I read something that I want to share with you, and I know that some of you are familiar with this. This is from the book, Great Controversies. This is from page 30. And this is describing right before the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, 
you can, I don't think I need to explain to you that there is an obvious reason why I can use this because it's relevant. The destruction of Jerusalem is a type of the destruction of the world. That's why Jesus in Matthew 24, he, he compares these two events and, and you know, uses the applications for both. So this is relevant for our discussion. There was a man in Jerusalem seven years before it was destroyed. Okay, now please listen. I'm going to just read the quote. For seven years, a man continued to go up and down the streets of Jerusalem, declaring the woes that were to come upon the city. By day and by night, he chanted the wild dirge, a voice from the east, a voice from the west, a voice from the four winds, a voice against Jerusalem and against the temple, a voice against the bridegrooms and the brides, a voice against the whole people. So this is really a very strong message. He was basically quoting parts of scripture. And, you know, he was in essence warning that there was this impending doom. And for seven years, he did this. This strange being was imprisoned and scourged. But no complaint escaped his lips. To insult and abuse, he answered only, woe, woe to Jerusalem, woe, woe to the inhabitants thereof. Now, this is really interesting because the, she goes on to say, his warning cry ceased not until he was slain in the siege he had foretold. Now, some of you are going to stop there and think, well, he died a martyr. But the very next sentence, without any, you know, I'm reading it exactly as it's given. Okay, the very next sentence that Ellen White says is, not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. So did he bear a message of truth? Yes, he did. Were his words designed to avert, you know, were they designed to help people, you know, make the right decision for God? Yes. But was he himself, even though he was warning people, was he himself changed? No. He wasn't. Because she says not one Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Folks, this is the, the point that I want to bring out from this explanation that I've given you. In the church today, there are traditionally two extremes when it comes to the work of Noah. There are some people that they want to warn the world and they like to preach or they like to give out literature or they like to do, you know, evangelism. They, they, they have that interest. And that's a great thing. I'm not going to go, you know, in because in, my, my goal is not to criticize, but I know people that at the drop of a hat, you know, they'll get up and they'll go, you know, share literature or they love to preach. They love to do evangelism. They'll fly overseas at their own expense. They'll do all these things. But some of these people, some of these very people would not give you their cell phone to let you browse what they have on their phones. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm not trying to condemn anyone here. I'm not. And, and, and some of these same people, they would be uncomfortable if you, if you looked on their computer and you checked their browser history, some of these people would be ashamed to invite you into their home for the things that they have in their home. And, and my point is that there are some people in the church that publicly, they look very zealous, but they have neglected the character preparation necessary to be ready for Jesus when he comes. But there's another extreme, and don't miss this. There are some people that they, they just want to be ready for Jesus when he comes. I think there's a story in the, in the States of like a prayer. It was this old farmer. Um, 
And his prayer was something like this. It was like, Lord, uh, help me to be saved. Help my wife to be saved. Hit my sons, my son and his wife, us four and no more. In other words, all he cared about was him and his family being saved. And there are people like that. Like I know people even here in the U.S., like they've moved out into the country, okay? And, you know, they, they, they're, they're farming, they grow their own food. And these are good things. I'm not saying this is a bad thing. But do you realize that God is not calling us to go out into the country and grow our own food just for the sake of doing that? No. God is calling us to escape the corrupting influences of the city, but he still wants us to work for the lost from those places in retired places in the country. Does that make sense? In other words, in the church today, and there are churches like this. I know whole churches where they do evangelistic meetings twice a year, and they have literature rooms and all of this. But, you know, th there are some things that, that they don't talk about in church. You know, they, they, there are some things that, that they're not going to get involved in. There's other churches, all they want to focus on is, you know, character preparation and you know they they have certain speakers that just emphasize you know like those kinds of topics so what i'm trying to say is god's people the message that jesus is giving us here is that it's we have twofold job we have to warn the world but we have to prepare characters that are of the same of the same standard that we are telling the world that god is coming you know, four. And so this is something that the story of Noah demonstrates very clearly that there is this, there is this um, dual nature to our work. Are we doing evangelism? Is it not effective? Maybe it's because the people don't see that we are really living what we say. And are we trying to really prepare our characters? I will say this, if you are really trying to prepare your character, but you have no burden for the lost, then you're not really preparing your character because righteousness, true righteousness always manifests itself in love for others. Okay. So, okay. All right. Enough of that. Okay. So let's move on now. Okay. So now we have to talk about the second part of Noah's message because Noah preached to the world, right? Okay, yes. So he, pre he was a preacher of righteousness. I think everyone agrees with that. But there's something else that Noah preached about. And I'm going to read this to you from the book, Patriarchs and Prophets. Okay, so this is from Patriarchs and Prophets. This is, um, this is from page like 96. Okay, so let me read this to you and, and we'll, we'll get an idea of what Noah was saying. The period of probation of their probation was about to expire. Noah had faithfully followed the instructions which he had received from God. The ark was finished in every part as the Lord had directed and was stored with food for man and beast. And now the servant of God made his last solemn appeal to the people. With an agony of desire that words cannot express, please listen to this, he entreated them to seek a refuge while it might be found. Okay. Um, so this is a simple point, but I need to make it. And that is this. Noah didn't just preach about righteousness. At some point, Noah invited the people to get onto the ark. Does that make sense? At some point, Noah told the people, listen, if you don't get onto the ark, the flood is going to kill you. The flood will destroy you. So not only did he preach against sin and point people to obey God's commandments, but at some point, his message was get onto the ark. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this point is that I think that some of you know <clears throat> that Getting onto the ark was not a simple thing. And if you're not sure of this, 
Um, I, I think that I can explain this fairly easily. Uh, okay, so, so first of all, um, I, I think that I'm in good company when I say that I am speaking to people in Botswana and um, I know that Okay, maybe I'm, you know, unless my geography is way off, I know that you guys don't have any oceans there, right? Like you are a landlocked country, although I know you have some very, very, you have some big lakes. So I, I'm aware of that. <clears throat> okay, but I think that most of you will, will get this idea that even in our time, if someone built a boat, on the land and told, invited people to get in, you know, that would be a pretty hard sell. When I was young, I actually got onto a, an aircraft carrier. It was the USS Intrepid. It was, it was docked in New York City. And it's basically a city. It's a city that's floating. It's, it, you know, it's big enough to land planes and it was gigantic. But don't miss this. It was in the water. It was actually in the ocean. Okay. Now, what Noah was being told to do was actually very, very difficult because he was telling, he was told by God to invite people onto the ark. Now, here's a few problems with this. Um, here's a few problems with this situation. Number one, and I need to read some things for you to give you some background as to what was going on in the people's minds. Here's what it says. The world before the flood, this is Patriots and Prophets, page 96. The world before the flood reasoned that for centuries, the laws of nature had been fixed. The recurring seasons had come in their order. Heretofore, rain had never fallen. The earth had been watered by a mist or dew. The rivers had never yet passed their boundaries, but had borne their water safely to the sea. Fixed decrees had kept the waters from overflowing their banks. Now, <clears throat> let, me, let me see if I can elaborate on this point. In Noah's day, it was unprecedented, the thought that water would fall from heaven. It was the opposite. Water came from, up from the ground. And not only that, but in Noah's day, they had this reasoning, like the wise people of that time, they understood this, and it was true, that up until that point, nature had never gone into catastrophe. There had never been these overwhelming disasters. Now, don't miss this. The science of Noah's day was technically correct. Okay, the science of Noah's day was technically correct in that they correctly reasoned that up until that point, nothing like that had ever happened. So does this make sense? Nobody would ever get onto the ark just out of curiosity. Like, you know, I wonder, I want to see what Noah, no. If you went onto the ark, you were facing ridicule. You were defying natural law. You were defying the experts of your day. Um, you were believing in something that had never happened. But if you did get onto the ark, then you would actually be believing what Noah said which was really what God had told him. And if you did that, then you would be exercising something called faith. Does that make sense? In other words, anybody that got onto the ark did not do it because it made sense or it was convenient. No, this was like the most difficult test, but it was a necessary test. God didn't want anybody that was sinful to go from the old world of sin to the new world after the flood, you know, destroyed everything. Because then in just one generation, you would have the exact same problem again. So God made it so that the ark was like the most challenging test 
that could have been conceived in that time. They had never seen a flood. They had never seen rain. The natural law, the natural science up until that point supported the skeptics. There's never been anything like this. And Ellen White actually says that people scorned Noah. So like you would have to, do you realize how social pressure influences people today? Like look at social media. When they jump on someone and they start condemning them, I mean, even legislators crumble at that. Do you get it? Like, like it's hard to have a million people hating you and, exp and you know, like people, like you, you check, people, when they speak out on truth, they get death threats. I mean, they threaten their families and just all kinds of crazy things. That's in our society. Can you imagine? It was worse back then. So you have to understand how much pressure was against these people to get onto the ark. So what God was doing was this. He was making it so that anybody that would get onto the ark was believing what really God had said. And by exercising faith, they could be accounted righteous and worthy to go from the old world to the new world. Now, folks, I think that most of you grasp this concept. Um, I think that most of you will understand that um, God was, in essence, trying to make sure that his people would be <clears throat> obeying him and not doing things just for convenience. And you know, when I see this, when I see this story, the application that comes down to us here at the very end of time. See, in Noah's day, the test was to get onto the ark. You know, before Jesus comes, the test will be Sabbath versus Sunday. And I need to stress this point because in the end, there is no logic to Sabbath keeping. Let me explain this. Let me explain what I mean. You know, there is no evidence in astronomy for the keeping of a seven-day week. You know that the earth goes around the sun one time. That's where we get a year. The earth is circled by the moon one time, and that's where we get a month. The earth rotates one time, and we get a day. But the seven-day week, there's nothing in nature that happens. The only explanation for the seven-day week is from the Bible. Don't miss this. That's why the French Revolution and Stalin and other people that wanted to erase God, they always attacked the seven-day week. The only evidence for the seven-day week is the Bible. And the seventh day being the Sabbath, the only support for that, the only support for that is from the Bible. In other words, when people choose to acknowledge the seventh-day Sabbath, it defies any human explanation and can only be accepted by the authority of God's word. And so people that are, are, are willing to say, okay, it doesn't make sense, but I'm willing to trust God and I'm willing to obey in the face of impending death. God says, okay, you have faith. I will make you righteous. I will account you righteous. And thus you are safe to save and bring to my eternal kingdom. Now, folks, I want to step back for a minute because I think some of you see where I'm going with this. In these last days, God has a message to give to the world. Do you realize that the message that Noah gave is our message? Let me explain. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Righteousness is obedience to God's commandments. The Bible says that in the last days, 
God's people give a, a message to the world. And how does it start? It starts out, fear God, right? Fear God. Let's pause. I, I don't want to assume anything because if you go through scripture over and over, and this quarter we study Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 6.2 makes it very clear that to fear God is to keep his commandments, to obey him. And, you know, that, that's illustrated in the story of, of Abraham. When Abraham was ready to kill his own son, God said, now I know that you fear God. So in scripture, to fear God is always equated with obedience. And that's the message that the, that the messenger that God's people are to give, to fear God. The next part of it says, fear God and give glory to him. Now, don't miss this. Because I know I've heard many explanations on what it means to give glory to God. And it's true. We should give glory to God in everything that we do, what we eat and drink. But how do you give glory to God? Romans 4.20 says, speaking of Abraham, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Now, let me explain this. You see, Noah preached the gospel in his day. And the Bible calls Revelation 14, 6, the everlasting gospel. So what does that mean? It's the same message. God is, to fear God is to keep his commandments. But how? To give glory to God is done when we exercise faith. Now, don't miss this. Those two things always have to go together. Because if I go back to the story of Noah, if Noah did not believe that the flood was coming, he would have never had the motivation for 120 years to build the ark. Faith enables you to obey God's commandments. It empowers you to obey God's commandments. In the same way, to fear God is to keep his commandments. But how is it done? by being strong in faith. And that's the same message that Noah was giving. He was telling the people, look, he was a preacher of righteousness. And then he was telling them, get on the ark. The only way that you could get onto the ark is if you exercised faith. Now, some of you are probably thinking, well, where's the rest of it? You know, you know for the hour of his judgment has come, worship him that made heaven and earth. It's not the scope of this message, but some of you will know this. You know when the door shut on the ark? Ellen White says that Noah didn't do it. He couldn't. If It was impossible from the inside to close the door. It was a divine light came down, and then angels shut the door, which means Noah was sealed inside the ark. He couldn't get out, even if he wanted to. Well, well anyway, you get the point, right? Don't miss this. <laughs> Right before that period, there was a period of probation for the inhabitants of the antediluvian world to decide if they were going to get onto the ark or not, which is the same thing that is happening in Revelation 14, verse 6. The angel is saying, look, fear God and give glory to him. So keep his commandments by faith. Why? Because we're living in the time of judgment. Okay? So it's the same thing. And, you know, in Noah's day... They worship the cre creature, they worship nature and trusted nature more than the creator. So somewhere in Noah's message, Noah was going to say something like this. You guys trust that nature is going to continue on as it always has, but the creator that made everything by his words is going to, by his words, cause a rain to fall and a flood to come. And really, in essence, this is the same idea about the Sabbath. It's the same concept of worshiping the creator over a created being and a, and a false church that has instituted a man-made uh, counterfeit. Now, some of you might think that I'm, I'm trying to just squeeze it all in, but don't miss this. The everlasting gospel has always been the same. It, at different periods in human history, the test has changed based on the circumstances of that time. But the gospel has always been from the beginning till the very end. It will always be the same. It will always be keep God's commandments through faith and worship God and, 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 and uh, honor him 
because we have a period of human probation after which our eternal destiny is decided. So to my brothers and sisters in Botswana and those that are watching, God gives us the example of Noah. He gives us a message like Noah. And I want to challenge you because the message that we are giving, we've been giving it for a long time, but what is lacking? It's that the world needs to see it as a witness. They need to see that what we say and what we do are one and the same thing. I'm going to be honest, you know, I'm not there yet, but I want to be there. And I believe that there are some of you watching right now that also can say the same, that you are not there now, but by God's grace and through the messages that are being presented during this camp meeting, you want to recommit yourself to be a messenger and a living witness of what we truly believe and understand what is happening in the world today. If that's you, I want to invite you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father in heaven, to my brothers and sisters all the way over there in Botswana, I, I'm praying a special benediction of consecration that Lord, you would help us. We, we know the words to say, but no doubt there is missing in some of our lives that witness, that testimony, that life that corresponds with the message. Lord, some of us, we need to cleanse our home. Some of us we need to clean our phones, our computers. We, we need to get our lives to be matching what the message is that you've given us to give. And my prayer is that we too, we would have faith in the overwhelming pressures that are coming. There are some pressures now. I can't even begin to imagine what's going to happen in a few, you know, in, when the crisis finally falls. Lord, help us in these small tests to be faithful. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, and I hope to see you for our third presentation. God bless you, and have a good night.